We bought this cooler originally for $2.77 on AliExpress. It's been as much as $7. And this is one of the cheapest possible aftermarket cooling solutions available on the market. The name for this is the Jonesbo CR1200 CPU cooler fan RGB three pin two heat pipe tower automatic lighting cooling fans heat sink. So the name could use a little bit of work, but we're going to go with CR1200. This is actually the first two heat pipe cooler we'll have on our test bench. It's a compact 92 millimeter tower with a pretty dense fin stack. Surprisingly, they've gone as far as including an RGB LED light in the top. And miraculously, it was under $3 when we bought it. Now, uh, the realistic among you, not even cynical, might say there's no way they're profiting on $3 for a cooler. How are they being subsidized? And we don't know. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. What we can tell you is that Jonesbow often OEMs for other companies. So they either own the factories or they have very good relationships with those factories. And that probably helps them a little bit on the pricing. The closest competition to this is probably going to be AMD's included Wraith heat sinks, so like the Prism or the Spire. And then next would be Thermal Rights Spirit, uh, the Assassin Spirit, now renamed to the Assassin X, which is about $19, and therefore hundreds of percent more expensive than the $3 Jonesbo cooler. So, uh, it seems like AliExpress has about a thousand of these literally left in stock after we bought the two that we bought, and we're going to take a look at it. So first off, Jonesbo is actually a real company. It's not just some fly-by-night sticker factory where all they do is buy things from someone else and put a sticker on it and ship it out the door again. So this is a company that's been around a long time. Jonesbo made the Rosewell Cullinan. We reviewed it many years ago. It's an old case. Rosewell is a house brand. God, it keeps doing that. It's like, a, it's like a store brand of Newegg. And uh, Jonesbo has been the supplier for brands like that for a long time where they'll make some tweaks to the supply, but for the most part, the business is kind of, you want one of our cases? Okay, here's the price. We'll put your logo on it. Deal done. Maybe we add a fan if you want to pay extra or whatever. Uh, so they're kind of real, which maybe explains part of why it's so cheap. The price range on this is extremely variable as a percentage because $2.77 uh, ranging up to $7 is over a 100% increase in price. So uh, I, that affects, I guess, the value judgment of the review. But nonetheless, it's, it's a sub $10 thing. The AliExpress page works actually really hard to try and sell this cooler. They highlight its, quote, nine centimeter color lamp effect with soft light fan blade to find a different beautiful fan blade detachable design for later cleaning and maintenance. I will give it to them. That's pretty convincing and is in fact why we bought it. The page also accidentally copies and pastes marketing from an entirely different product page when it says four six millimeter heat pipes, which is actually just not true. It's two heat pipes, like they already said, but it's $2.77. So you can't expect them to be honest with their marketing at that price. I look at Corsair, Nvidia, AMD, Intel. Everyone at some point has fudged the numbers a little bit for far more expensive products. We think what they're trying to say is that it's two heat pipes, and if you multiply it by two, it becomes four. Because when you look through it, it looks like four, but it's two because that's how a pipe works. But Jonesbo has some brand credibility and as long as it's better than free coolers that are included in the CPU, you pay for them, of course, uh, that's really all it has to be better than. And if it stands as a viable alternative for CPUs that don't include a cooler, then fair enough. From Amazon, the competition is the Amazon Basics cooler we reviewed several weeks ago. And uh, this is just a Cooler Master basically rebrand with some uh, slight modification like to the labeling. But the most obvious difference is the fin thickness and some of the uh, fin density, where these fins are much 
flimsier, and uh, they make a particular sound when you interact with them that kind of makes clear how flimsy they are. But as long as it performs, it's all that really matters. Uh, so, this thing... <laughs> This thing has measurements of 93 millimeters wide, it has a 92 millimeter fan, it's 128 millimeters tall, and it's 67 millimeters deep. Clearance is not an issue for RAM with this because it's about the same depth as the CPU socket itself. It is a very small cooler and the height is beneficial to it as well. The cooler supports everything from LJ775 to LJ1700 and FM1 to AM2 up to AM5. So they do that with a simple bracket and an at times uncomfortable clamp system, which Mike will talk about later. To be fair, we're actually incredibly impressed with the cost for the size. Even if it's $7 when you find it, it's still pretty good pricing, but that doesn't mean anything without some numbers. So time to get into some thermal testing. We'll link the CPU cooler testing methodology in the description below if you wanna learn about it. it. Hasn't changed much since we posted that. For this cooler, we are only running one heat load, and that's gonna be about 68 watts because anything more than that, like say the 120 watt heat load is just not gonna be able to do. That's the end of the story for that. This would be comparable to lower price CPUs like an R5 5600, most i3 CPUs, some i5 non-K CPUs depending on generation. Uh, and given the wide compatibility for this cooler, which again includes a socket type that dates back to 2006, one caveat here is we have not tested all of those socket types with this. So it's possible that this doesn't work well with some of the sockets. It dates back to 2006. We cannot possibly find the time to test that many sockets. You're talking sockets that probably a lot of people in the audience have never heard of, or at least never built with. So uh, just some context there, but we've got some newer stuff. So let's get started. Our first chart uses a 68 watt heat load with noise normalized fan speeds and we're using the fans included with the coolers. This is the chart that we ended up with and we'll look at the max fan speed next. The Jones Bow CR1200 cooler held 35 dBA at 20 inches distance in our standard environment when running at 1870 RPM or about 9.7 volts under DC control. It kept the CPU at 48 degrees delta T over ambient for T die and that means that it's the same in both idle and load temperatures as the AMD Wraith Prism cooler at the same noise level. It's not a great start, but if you buy a CPU that doesn't include one of those coolers, which is most of them at this point, it'd be one of the cheapest alternatives to go with the CR1200. The CR1200 outperforms the Wraith Spire though. The Spire's 52 degree result creates a four degree gap, which is relatively large for the price, and spending an extra 13 to $17, depending on timing, would get you the Thermal Right Assassin Spirit, which is now commonly sold as the Assassin X120. That cooler runs an impressive 10 degrees cooler, which is massive when talking thermals. That's enough to support a higher power CPU, like 125 watt heat load, and is a big jump in the quality of cooler. The CR1200 fits the bill of minimum viable for something like this, which is a valid category. That's a product that needs to exist, just be aware that it is in fact minimally viable and it has limitations. We'll also briefly look at VRM thermals. That's because the closest competition is Andy's downdraft prism, which should have an advantage for VRM cooling due to its top-down flow. The CR1200 did fine for the VRM. It's not like the CPU cooler is solely responsible for the MOSFETs, but our hypothesis was otherwise proven here. The Prism held the VRMs at 22.9 degrees Celsius over ambient up to 25.1. Depends on which FET you looked at. The CR1200 ran about four degrees warmer, so it's not terrible, but it is proof of concept that the downdraft is beneficial here, and if it's otherwise the same, it's just not a good position for the CR1200 to be in. Fully unlocking the fan speed and loosening that control, we land at 38.6 dBA for the CR1200, which when tested equally to the others, makes it significantly quieter than the Prism's 100% noise level at 47.2 dBA. For reference, a 10 dBA difference is approximately a two times increase in perceived volume to the human ear. Now, we're not talking about acoustic power here, that scales closer to say 3 dB, but rather the perceptible change. The Prism is about two times louder than to the ear when at 100% speed. And for that increase, it climbs the charts to 42 and a half degrees Celsius over ambient. The CR1200 landed at 46.6. 
So that's a four degree increase for significantly less noise. It's not bad. It's actually one of the better qualities here, but it's still less scalable and there's less room to pump the RPM if you really needed to. This makes the 1200 better outright than the Spire, but worse than just about everything else. And the passive coolers are kind of a different thing. Once again, the $19 Thermal Right Spirit dominates for its price at 37.9 degrees. And of course, that's the one that's been renamed. So you look for the Assassin X. Now it's time to look at installation and hear from Mike about some of his thoughts on how the cooler installs. So as is becoming tradition, we're going to start with AM4. Then we're going to cover the differences with the Intel installation, and then we'll close out with some critiques and criticisms. So the installation on AM4 here is completely toolless. You don't need any tools. There's, there's no screws to install. We're going to utilize the stock AM4 brackets here. So I've already got my CPU socketed, so I'm just going to go ahead and put some thermal paste down. So if you've ever installed a stock AM4 or AM5 cooler, this process is going to look very familiar, and you probably don't love it. I certainly don't love it. So we're just going to hook one side here. Get that pushed down. Hold some pressure and push down our other clip until it is latched. And uh, that's it. Well, I guess that's not totally it. I haven't installed the fan yet. Um, this fan is actually, it's, a, it's pretty nice for a cheapo cooler. It's got some foam on the back here. We're going to want that facing the cooler, and that's just going to cut down on some vibration and dampen any noise that would occur otherwise without those foam pads there. This cooler uses some traditional fan clips, so nothing terribly complex about this. And that wraps up the AM4 AMD installation. So let's take a look at the Intel installation. You are going to need to install your CPU first before you put this bracket down, because as you can see, it's going to prevent you from lifting that levering arm for the ILM. This is not a new approach to installing this style of cooler onto the Intel sockets. We're going to drop, so we're going to put a bracket into place, then we're going to drop down these plastic plugs or clips that are actually going to go through the holes here. And you're going to push those down and they're going to clip into place. And then you're going to follow it up with this plastic plug and that just keeps it from coming back out. Um, we're not going to go to all four corners because then the rest of the installation is the same as AM4. Critiques and criticisms. Um, it's a cheap cooler. These latching style coolers are kind of a pain. They hurt your fingers. They're uh, even more difficult to get off than they are to put on. Um, not a fan of them, but I mean, we're, we're at a super duper budget class cooler here. Um, I thought the vibration dampening foam on the back of the fan was kind of a nice touch at this price point. Um, everything you touch on the cooler feels very cheap. It's just, it's a budget product, so I guess that's to be expected. But beyond that, it worked fine. We didn't have any problems with the fan. All, all the components were there. So that wraps up the installation segment. Uh, back to you, Steve. Pressure testing is up next. This looks at the pressure applied by the cooler's mounting hardware to the CPU. And it's the same bracket used for everything, for all of those sockets that were listed earlier. That includes AM5, LJ1700, AM4, uh, and all the older stuff too. We are sponsoring this section of the video with our own project and soldering mat, which you can grab on store.gamersnexus.net for a really hefty surface for all kinds of hobbyist or enthusiast projects. And a massive thanks to everyone who's bought one of these. We're thrilled to see all the tweets coming in for various uses, ranging once again from things like models and hobbies to electronics repair. These help fund our testing efforts in lab directly and allow us to continue pushing high quality content without sacrifice. The team here is proud of the work we put out and we're able to take our time on it thanks to those of you who support us on store.gamersnexus.net or via patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Here's the results. Tested on the first Ryzen CPU, we got a terrible pressure map. This is closer to the Amazon Basics cooler, and we'll show that again briefly, than anything else we've looked at. It's not a surprise though, given the price and some of the mounting considerations that Mike had, like the fact that it's just a clamp, but that doesn't make it less bad as a result. We can clearly see two heat pipes making solid contacts. Just the rest of the cooler is under minimal pressure and it relies more heavily on good paste spread. 
We see that trend continue in the next scan, although the pressure on this one increased on those two heat pipes and the left edge. For the next CPU, we saw basically the same results between the two pressure scans. This is the weakest point of the cooler, the pressure itself, and it's what contributes to that lower ranking positioning on the charts compared to, say, the AMD stock coolers. The final test is for cold plate flatness. Although this isn't the most important metric standalone, it can be coupled with the pressure test to have a full understanding of how a cooler might conform to a CPU. The CR1200 had a good result for the median flatness, that's the box on the chart, with a couple of spiky craters to maximally 121 microns of depth point to point. That's a large delta, but the important thing is the context of it. In this case, it's a single deep point in the contours, and we can find this along the heat pipes, for the direct contact in the plate. The pipes could use some more fill and material around them to improve this contact further, but that would make this more than $3 or 7 or whatever it is right now, so that's not viable for something that is in fact minimally viable, because this passes the bar of, eh, it works, I guess, so let's ship it. It's not as bad as we'd expect, though, for such a cheap cooler, so it gets some credit for at least being better than the Corsair A500, which was like a $100 mainstream brand cooler back when it launched. This video is pretty simple, really. It's fun. It's fun to look at stuff like this that is either just miraculously cheap or weird or way too expensive. And in this case, it's certainly not what we would call good, but it probably qualifies for fine. Uh, and that's fine. <laughs> it's not really meant to be a high power cooler. This is okay for a low power CPU. So something like 65 watts, something like an R5 3000 series, an R5 5600 non-X especially, that's a really efficient chip with pretty low power consumption. Those would make sense for this. I3s, stuff like that. If you haven't included Wraith Prism, uh, if you're using AMD, you should probably just use the Wraith Prism. Maybe there's some kind of specific use cases that apply to you. I think I cut my skin a little bit earlier when I was <laughs> scratching the fins. They are very thin. Uh, so it may apply to you for something like a specific compact tower, maybe you have a really, just again, specific build in mind of some kind of front to back, going to be a small case, but still large enough to accommodate 92 millimeters, and some reason you don't want downdraft. Maybe it's right up against the glass panel, something like that. But although then you'd have the height problem for this one. So uh, this, we basically, what we're getting at here is this is better than nothing. Uh, and there are coolers that are worse than nothing. Uh, coolers that would only throttle on basically anything, those are worse than nothing because it leads you to believe that it's functional when it's not. This is functional at low heat loads. It's better than the older Spire. It's not better than the Prism. The Prism's about the same in the 35 dBA noise normalized results, and it's better for VRM cooling, if that matters too much, uh, and it's definitely better at the top end 100% speed because it has more room to boost that fan. The Thermalrite Spirit here, or the Assassin X as they call it now, it's like 18 bucks, and this one is probably, it's the best in class that we've tested at the moment in terms of cheap coolers. But once again, very different price category from this. Uh, however, if you want something that's a little bit more real in that it can support higher wattage CPUs, this is where we'd send you. Extremely competitive at the price point for something like 125 watt CPU, somewhere in there. Mounting for the Jones Bow cooler is also fine. It's a little bit annoying to dismount on AM4 just because you'll need to kind of keep that pressure loaded as evenly as you can so it doesn't rip the CPU out of the socket at an angle. This is a little more prone to that than a four-point design, but you can work around it. And then the price range is $3 to $7 on AliExpress and it's 15 or so from Amazon in the U.S. So that's it for this one. Uh, pretty interesting. It's fun. If you have any other unique coolers you'd like us to look at, let us know what they're called in the comments and upvote each other so we can see the most interesting ones float up to the top. And we'll buy those and we'll review them in our next one. We'll maybe do a roundup or something. But uh, the whole team enjoys working on these because they're simple, they're straightforward, and they're interesting. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab a solder mat or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly and get a couple of extra behind-the-scenes videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.